anoint Greg, your servant, this morning. Uh, Lord, I, I pray that your Holy Spirit would empower him to accurately teach and to declare the things that you have in Scripture for us. Father, more than that, I pray that you would use Greg and use his ministry as your ministry this morning. So, Father, speak to us through your uh, Holy Spirit, the uh, Scripture that he has inspired uh, to lift up and draw our attention to Jesus Christ, our hope and our Savior. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. 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 Good morning, church, and thank you, Joe, for the welcome, the invitation, and the warm welcome, and it's just such an honor to be here. In fact, we'll just take a quick half step back, as it was just uh, 2012, as I was starting with just, like, literally starting with the c to c network, met with uh, Joe and a couple other people uh, at, the, uh, the c- at the James Bay Square area there, and we had a coffee, and uh, we did a prayer walk around, and uh, kind of, you know, I just thought, this is so exciting to be able to be here in person. In fact, since I've at least, at least, I think at least once for sure, because I remember actually saying to Joe, are you available? If not, I'm going to prayer walk, you know, just in Victoria for, uh, for something and had a, an extra hour free, and I always want to keep asking the Lord, you know, what is there anything particular you'd like me to do while I have this uh, gap of time? And I, the Spirit compelled me to prayer walk around here, so I just sent a little note to Joe to say, you know, just you know, with you guys, like feeling. And to actually be here in person, what an honor and a privilege. I'm, I'm glad to talk about MB Mission. I actually live in um, Richmond, Vancouver there, and in Richmond there's a, a lot of people that like to drive MB cars, so they're very surprised that, uh, Mennonite, that uh, Mercedes-Benz has a mission. But I'm like, no, no, not that one. Mennonite Brethren. Oh, okay, well, that's a little less. Uh, <laughs> so no company car for me. But uh, I, what I would like to do is uh, lead from the Word and then bring in a little bit about the, the mission work that we're up to, because you'll then hear it coming from uh, the heart of the Lord here from Scripture. And... Um, and then afterwards, we're going to have potluck and hang out. So I'm glad to talk a little bit more about my story. I have a wonderful wife, a couple of teenage kids uh, who sent me to be here, and they're, uh, they're uh, with me in spirit this morning. And we have a wonderful conference of churches, uh, more than 100 uh, British Columbia Mennonite Brethren churches across this uh, gorgeous province uh, who are with you in spirit. And I, I mentioned to Joe as uh, we came in the door here this morning, like, yeah, there are people right now praying for you, praying for us, who maybe have never been to Victoria. Wherever I go, including today, you can uh, sign up to have a brief to the point uh, prayer updates that I send up because we need more prayer. And wherever I'm having the privilege of traveling and opening the word and meeting with people, like, it's just so much better when the wind is at the back of the Spirit moving. So people are praying for us right now, isn't it? It's so much more than us. But it certainly includes you folks. So from, um, I thought, that was such a great introduction. You're head of steam there. So I'll take that last point as an on-ramp. How's that? So from the persecution scattered all these believers, all like everyone's put onto the road, running for their lives, their collective lives, and they end up in a place called Antioch where they plant a church. A church gets going. So we're going to jump in at uh, chapter 13, the first four verses, and then take a quick half step back to look at the context and then have uh, five brief and amazing points today. Who, what, when, where, why of the heart of God for mission. So now there were at the church in Antioch, prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manane, a lifelong friend of Herod the Tetrarch, which has got to be, I'm like, where's, where's the, like, sometimes when I'm reading, like, where's the little, uh, the little, open the fold here for the rest of that story, like, Herod the Tetrarch put John the Baptist to death, like, if, you, you know, it's like, how interesting, and, uh, of course, Saul, and while they were worshiping, and the Lord in fasting, the Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I've called them. Then after fasting and praying, they laid hands on them and sent them off. So just to get to the quick point of the point here is this is a church plant, at least a year old, and they're having a great prayer meeting and the Holy Spirit puts them into being church planters. The first missionary sent out, the first Global ambassadors for Jesus are sent out from this first 
non-Jewish church plant. So it's quite a story here that really links to your story. Now, as a, um, a way to jump in here, so I'll, I'll just skip the first two pages because of that uh, wonderful on-ramp there. There we go. Look, we're just making such good progress here. So who calls who to whom? First point, the who, what, when, where, why. That, how do you talk about the mission heart of God? Like, let's ask all the questions. Who, what, when, where, why. So who calls who to whom? You get three who's in the first two. Well, here we drop into this church in Antioch, and they are caught in a prayer meeting. I mean, this is not a church with the prayer, but a church of prayer. And what comes out from the prayer call to mission? Well, they're ministering to the Lord fasting. The Holy Spirit said, set apart for me. Barnabas and Saul for the work of which I've called them. There's an inferred call here, and I think recently, if I, Jove and I visited uh, at our pastor's retreat last week, and someone apparently preached here recently about the conversion of Saul to Paul. Yes, yes. You, anyone here that week? Anyone, there, I see that hand. There we go. So, uh, the next thing that happens, if you follow that story after the, uh, the, the blinding, the scales come off, the healing, there's the call. And in Acts, chapter 9, 15, Paul is called to be an ambassador to the Gentiles, the ethne, the nations. So God calls his people to go to other people who've not heard about him. You know, back in creation, God created man, and then God, and it was good, God created woman, and it was very good, together, and they walked in communion with God. This is what I would call the basic quorum of community, the two or three gathered in his name. Uh, Matthew eighteen twenty, Jesus declares, I'm in their midst. So um, I don't know if you've ever thought about the sacraments. We have the Lord's table. We have baptism in particular that we're told to do as uh, followers of Jesus. And you know, you really need another person. Like, it, Unless you're on that deserted island. I know we're on an island, a big one. I just heard about an island that's like, what, how big is, like how small is that island? 10? 100 feet by 100 feet. On the way to Greenland. So if you're on that island, you'd be by yourself apparently because nobody lives there. But it, mostly we're not living by ourselves in an island. So we need someone to break bread with. You need someone to baptize someone. You know, like you can't just, I baptize myself in the name of the Father, the, you know, <laughs> and fall into the water and lift yourself. No, it's like someone, this is the blessing of the body of Christ. And and even if it's just two of you, like if you're in a tight spot or you're somewhere, you find another believer, you can break the bread. It's you, another, in the presence. This is the essential Christian community that then welcomes more others. So who calls? The first two, well, God calls by his spirit. It's very plain. Who is called? In this case, it's the two main leaders of the Antioch church plant. Imagine we're, you know, you guys are getting settled in here, and, um, and then let's, uh, oh, hey, we're having a good prayer meeting. Hey, so Joe, Glenn, you guys are called out by the Spirit, and you're going to go, and when you get back, report in. That, does this sound like a good plan? <laughs> Heather's like, no, it's not a good plan. <laughs> Can I come? But the thing is, there's this this sending. Like, we don't usually send the premium up front primary leaders. Maybe we'll send some rookies or some young people or, you know, more expendable people or impressionable people. But this is the, uh, let's call out the actual planters and send them on this first ever mission trip. So they're also called to people to this ethne, to the Gentiles, the other nations. We need to have the right view, not just of the proper use of the Greek term, as uh, that is very important, but also the right sense of what we're talking about. Because these days, with globes, everyone have a globe or an atlas or uh, an app with a map, whatever it is these days to find your bearings, we can't help ourselves now in our advanced modern times who think that a nation is a country. A nation state. Nation is a country. Well, in fact, that's a very modern, recent invention. In most of the world today, in fact, in Canada, this is still something that we're, uh, I mean, 
wherever we are standing in Canada, it's, it's, it's an ongoing conversation about the land and the nations. Because the nations before the country was the people who lived there, who were tribal, who were clans, who were uh, uh, not defined or confined by a, a cartographer's line on a piece of parchment. So it's less helpful to think of a country, but more helpful to think of tribal groups. So let's pick China, for example. China has 542, apparently, people groups, tribal groups. The Han Chinese who speak Mandarin are the dominant, the primary one, but there's 542 of these groups. So when you look at a group like... MB mission, you know, you want to have your uh, like bumper sticker sense of like, why are we here? Well, this is our, uh, this is our call, is to bring the gospel to the unreached, to go to the least reached. So it's not just that there are people who are people somewhere, it's that there are, there actually are diligent people who have looked around the globe year after year after year to define who's who. Which groups of people have or have not yet heard the gospel? So technically we call people who've not yet uh, received the gospel unreached people. The technical definition would be a people group within which there's no indigenous community of believing Christians able to evangelize their people group. So you might be curious then how many people groups are there that are unreached? So Scholars and experts say there's 17,000, approximately, groups of people on the earth. Like there's a lot of billion people, but 17,000 people groups defined. And 7,000 remain unreached. But it's not a proportionate thing, because of the seven or so billion people, 42%, over three billion people, do not yet live in a, have not yet heard the gospel in their heart language, and thus the reason for the mission. The global mission of God is to go to the unreached people, and this would be our essential heart as a mission. So back to China, the 542 groups, 446 are yet unreached. That's 82%. So I say that again for emphasis. Like That's really amazingly a lot. So of the 542 people groups in one country... 446 are yet unreached, so the task is set before us, especially with the fact that it's, for many of these nations, it's increasingly difficult, if not impossible, for someone from here to go to there as a, quote, missionary. There is no visa anymore for that category of travel. So you typically need to have a value-added thing, like a teacher, like a business person, an engineer, or a business person. You could have both. It, it gets you in the front door and uh, allows you to then be an ambassador for Christ. Or you could be from another group of people within that country. And this is what's interesting, what's happening now is, I think of a, uh, a people group, like Tibet. Everyone's like, hey, free Tibet, get a flag, a little poster, the Dalai Lama comes through, he's the big hero, but uh, Tibet is doubly locked down. Of course, there's the geopolitical issue, but more than that, it's a spiritual issue. They, uh, that, that is just a really uh, dark spiritual place there on the top of the world. And um, I had the privilege once to travel there, and it's like, wow, like watching... People on pilgrimage. Like this is like you see the promotional programs and the and the peace, peace, peace. And but what actually goes on is anything but. People on the pilgrimage bleeding from their knees and their elbows and their forehead as they take a few steps and bow and they take and uh, and that's not even the worst of it. The superstitions that are gripping people's hearts that that Christ came to set people free. But how will they hear if no one tells them? How will anyone tell them if no one is sent? And thus, we are here. So who, well, God calls people like you to people who need to hear. To do what? Well, to go as people of peace, to bring the gospel to the lost. And this is a critical point that I would not want to miss 
Well, we're standing right here because there's a big difference of leaving and being sent. This is a, not just for people who might go to another country. I'm talking about going anywhere to serve God because there's a whole lot of this individualistic Christianity in North America where, you know, me, myself, and Jesus, and, our, and you know, like I hear the Lord, and, but without a robust and proper sense of community, we can just be, uh, you know, the madly dashing in all directions, leaving, and, you know, the important stuff to do, but I'll tell you what's better, what's better is being sent. When you are sent out, and this is what we see in this story here, you have authority and backing. So like I'm, I'm sent to, like I'm actually sent to be here with you folks this morning. Invited, thank you very much, but then sent with backing. I'm so encouraged to be here and I w- pray that the Spirit will encourage you. To leave is a potentially solitary choice, but to be sent is to be blessed and to bring the community along with you. It's very powerful. At the end of the service, we will send you, I'm assuming nobody is living in the community center, we will send you towards where you live to be on God's mission. So in our text, there's a double sending. They're sent by the church and they're sent by the Holy Spirit. The first sending of the church is the letting go with blessing and resources. Kind of the picture comes to mind of pushing the canoe off the dock. You know, like there's all these people gathered around and some people are going in the canoe and you, you push them off, give them a good, a good start. Sometimes it might feel like a slingshot as you get on an airplane and go somewhere. But someone is sending, and it's really behind it, the Holy Spirit who gives a sense of direction and a sense of empowering to go there and do that, which is our story here today. We could, uh, in fact we had longer, we could look at the next couple of chapters, which is the fullness of this first mission trip. There's three mission trips that are chronicled in Acts. This is the first one. It's the shortest, but not at all the least eventful, because stuff happens like just a few verses in, they end up on Cyprus, and there's this fellow who's a Roman leader who really wants to hear the word of God, but then there's this false prophet magician guy who's trying to get in the way of this person hearing the gospel. I thought, boy, that sounds like that might happen in a place like Victoria. Someone actually wants to hear the gospel, but then there's someone else who gets stirred up to get in the way. Someone who's into new age, someone who's into all sorts of spiritual stuff, but not following Jesus. You know, people are inherently spiritual. We're created in the image of God, which puts within us that yearning to seek not just truth, but to, <laughs> but to seek a relationship with God. So you're in your world, your friends, your neighbors, your relatives, like there are people who are, have an, a, a yearning for God. And around them, there's people who are making it their busy business to distract them and lead them somewhere else. And it's your call to actually be on the mission to pay attention and to lead someone then to Christ. This is the dynamic time within which we live. So the Roman leader does believe and the false prophet is very humbled. Uh, This group of missionary leaders, uh, they're um, nearly beaten up. One time Paul is stoned with actual stones, left for dead. They bring the gospel to the Gentiles, the ethne, who then rejoice, glorify God. Uh, The whole place starts going and going and going with the gospel. And in verse 23 of chapter 14, they appoint elders in every church. So they're starting churches where they go, appointing elders, just like you. This should feel very familiar. This is the biblical story. And then this takes on life and becomes a movement. Our um, ministry team in Southeast Asia about 25 years ago felt a certain call to go to a group of people who live between Thailand and Laos. Again, people groups don't live defined by the country. They live like they have for generations in areas. And there's this group of people called the Khmu, K-H-M-U, who live between Laos, northern Thailand, a little bit into uh, China, Vietnam, in that general region, but mostly Laos and northern Thailand as a kind of a heartland. 
And this is the, uh, this is the nobody people. You know, there's the somebodies and the nobodies. So these are the people who are on the, like, the low end, despised, uh, the politics disadvantaged them, and they are everybody's servant. And you know, there's something about the gospel that just loves those kind of people. The heart of God is for the lost. That's the big word for today. The heart of God is for people who yet have not heard about him. And there's this, there's this call, there's this sending to go out to bring this good news. But there's this special affection for the people for whom they have no recourse. And our ministry team just felt leading to the sense of leading of the Spirit to go for this people group and found them to be very receptive. And in, you know, the, the fullness is in a very short amount of time, like within the last 25 years, there are now more, again, the point is not the denomination, it's just how do you, like people have families and how do you count stuff and how do you organize things. So it's a family of churches that now have more Mennonite brethren people in the group than in Canada. So there, there are now more Mennonite brethren Camus believers than there are Mennonite brethren Canadian believers. Because it's a movement. I think that's really fun. <laughs> in fact, there's also more Mennonite brethren uh, believers in Democratic Republic of Congo by far than in Canada. You know, it's movement. And if you remember the old uh, shampoo commercial, and they told two friends, and they told two friends, and they told two friends. Like, it's just, this is the sense of how the Spirit, like, uh, this part of why we come to hardworking local churches here in Canada who maybe just aren't seeing this today, but around the world, this is actually happening. The gospel is bearing fruit. And sometimes it's in bushel baskets, and sometimes it's one at a time. But everything's valuable before the Lord. So this is this is the what do we do? We bring the peace. And how do we do this? Well, it's, we, we see this, like Jesus sent out the 12 first, and then he sent out the 70 or 72, depending on how they were counting. And it's with this simple thing, like, okay, I'm not talking the rocket science. Are you ready? Prayer. Being people of his presence. As you go into a place, find a house and settle down. Presence. Like, get to know people. Like, does anyone here actually have a neighbor? Like, you probably, um, uh, my right to guess, you just might have a neighbor. <laughs> You're not on your own island on the way to Greenland. That's like, I've never heard of that. That's so fun. And you have people in your life, around you. So you bring the presence. You're people of the presence of the peace of Christ and of the proclamation Someone somewhere has to actually say something for Christ. You know, there's this, uh, what's been attributed to St. Francis of Assisi, who, uh, you know, loves all the animals and was very sacrificial in how he lived. Uh, it was purported to say, preach the gospel at all times, and if necessary, use words. Joe might have already pointed out to you that there's a couple problems here. Number one is he never actually said it, so that's kind of a problem. Okay, so so much for the famous attestation. But secondly, it's a problem because it's, it's just not biblical. Like, we certainly are to live virtuous lives. Like, let the unsaved see how you live, and that's part of our testimony. So if you've walked in here today and you're like, like, what, what is that Beacon Community sign? And, um, you know, like, I realize that there's these people at work, my neighbors, my relatives who, actually, now they come to think of it, like, there's just something, I, I pray this is true, right? Like, there's just something about them. Like, they've got this, no matter what happens, they've got this joy. They've got this bigger picture of hope than just what is going on. Like, that's so interesting. Like, how do you do that? How, like, that, that should be the way that our lives, the fragrance of Christ is another biblical picture. We talk about the imagery in the songs, the imagery in Scripture. Like, we should smell good, as followers of Jesus. That's not us, it's Christ within us. Because I promise you, like part of my testimony would be left to myself, without Christ, you don't want to know me. I could tell you that story over lunch. Like, cause, why? Because I don't care. But wow, when the Holy Spirit gets a, a part of, gets a hold of your life, gets your heart going, 
It's amazing the transformation that will come. So that's what we bring. We bring through prayer, through the presence, through the proclamation, we bring this good news. Now this third point is really brief. Are you ready? This is, so we've got who, what, when. Are you ready? Is everybody ready? Three, two, one, today. This is not one of those like, wow, I need to like, you know, let's have a five-year plan. Like I need to like, wow, like a, I don't know, like, can I have a week or two to think through, like, okay, so I'm into this, but, uh, like, I just, it sounds like a little rushed. Like, can I have some time before I get into, like, obeying this thing, though? No, it's actually a very good biblical word is called today. Think of Zacchaeus, the rich tax collector, despised by all the neighbors, the traitor. He climbs up the tree, scampers up, because he wants to see Jesus. Everyone's trying to keep him from seeing Jesus. Jesus calls him out by name, calls you by name to friendship and fellowship, salvation, eternity in his presence. But what does Jesus say not once but twice if you know that story? Today, salvation's come to this house. Today. It's the mission of the Son of Man, the mission of Jesus is to what? To seek and to save the lost. And it's not a philosophical term or a missiological study. This is literally today, my dear friends. Well, you and I have today, because we know tomorrow has enough worries of its own. Should the Lord give us tomorrow? Well, today's what we have to steward. And I'm looking at you. I'm, I'm, I'm looking at people who the Lord has an assignment for. If you've walked in today and you're like, I'm not sure if Jesus, like, I, I'm feeling it, but I'm just not sure is, like, if, if anything happened to me, like, would I really know Jesus? Would Jesus know me? Today is the day to be confident of your salvation. And today is the day we're called to bring that to the people that we are led to encounter, whether it's the so-called random, hey, I've long given up on random <laughs> No, you're on a, we're on assignment. In fact, on the way over here this morning, I was delighted but somewhat disappointed that the whole time I spent talking to a pastor who was coming to Victoria, I'm like, that was very nice, but I miss, like I'm always hoping for a chance to be able to meet someone who doesn't yet know Jesus, but okay, I'll take a pastor, and, and that, was, that was delightful, but that's our assignment today. So where? Well, where the Spirit leads us. So the book of Acts describes these missions trips, and we don't see in this one how they're so specifically led, but can we look at the next one and, and then look backwards? Because I'm thinking this must be kind of like the way it goes down. So in Acts chapter 16, they actually uh, open up a little bit of like, and here's how it actually happened. Again, I'm always, uh, I'm, I'm, as a pastor and as uh, someone who highly values the Word of God, uh, I'm very, very cautious about speaking to the silence of Scripture because in the first mission trip, it isn't plainly stated how they knew where to go. But if we look at the second mission trip, I think it's probably pretty fair to assume it might be like the first mission trip. So in Acts 16, verses 6 to 10, because this is so interesting. They went through the region of Phrygia and Galatia, and having been forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia, they then came to Mysia and attempted to go to Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus did not allow them. And you're like, what sort of a mission trip is this? They're not allowed to preach anywhere. So passing by Messiah, and they keep going, like they're, like they're led, they're led, and they keep going, they went to Troas, and a vision appeared to Paul in the night, and a man of Macedonia was standing there, urging them to come, saying, come over to Macedonia and help us. When Paul had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go on to Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. So even extrapolating, there's this vivid sense of call. And again, this is another one. I'd love to have that little, like, just like open here for exact instructions of how, do, like, how did they know not to go there? Like this, like, you'll see also in Scripture that, the, that Satan prevented them from going, well, you want to know that too because you want to push through that one. You want to name that. You want to deal with it. You want to press through. 
But we always talk about praying, like, Lord, open the door, Lord, close the door. Like, these are things that, that we say without necessarily thinking through what that means. And even we're in good intentions, we're going out towards somewhere, and the Lord can steer our lives to go to somewhere else. So I want to tell a quick story of where I literally saw this happen um, not that long ago, I had the privilege of being in Myanmar, or Burma as it was classically known, um, going along in the entourage, like the book of Acts, uh, we always send people out at least two by two, as Jesus said, or more, a small team. So we're following a fellow named Pastor Isaiah. Pastor Isaiah was a former Burmese monk who then, like many people, became a migrant worker to Thailand. In Thailand, he found Christ, heard the gospel, gave his life to Christ, and God called him to go back to his village. His village in Myanmar has, well, now there's a church. Before going back, there was no church. All his people had never heard the gospel. So there's a sense of repatriating, being called back home. So a few of us joined along with him on another trip, and uh, the first part of the day, which is the part, the part that we knew about, so this is that sense of God leading us. So we knew there was an invitation for the morning to meet with some pastors to encourage them and to share about uh, the things of Christ, which um, it's interesting, our, our host, Pastor Isaiah, I, he was thinking that that's good. Like, like maybe me meeting this pastor this morning coming over. It's like, that's good. But he's actually a, a amazing evangelist. Like he, like he a, a, a great day for him is that he gets to share his story, share the gospel with someone who's not yet heard the gospel. So a good day, great day. Well, so it's a good day. We have the pastor's meeting, have some lunch, we get back in the little van, we're going to go back to the hotel, and then we make this side stop on this little village area. It's very poor, very hard-baked, people just eking out a life. Well, apparently there was this little hovel with a couple. One of the couple had come to Christ, but not their spouse. So uh, it was like, hey, there's this little village. Maybe we can go in and share Jesus to the spouse. So we sit in this little hovel. It's so poor, and it's so hot, and we just have this heart to pray that the spouse will find Christ. And then Soon enough, one, two, three, four, five other people are dropped off by bikes or little scooters. So then here we are, like literally knee to knee on this little bamboo hovel and, you know, a little cup of tea and it's just like wretchedly poor. Like these folks, how do they live, right? But their hearts are yearning. So our evangelist Isaiah, he shares his testimony. I don't know Burmese, but I'll tell you, I, I watched a lively, robust discussion going on, a little Q&A, and then I watched him uh, say something, and five out of five hands went up, including the spouse of the farmer. And then he leads them, you know, clearly in a repeat-after-me prayer to have confidence in Christ, and we're like, come on. This is a great day. <laughs> so pastor's meeting... Side trip to the hovel, five out of five people except Christ. And we think, okay, so we can go back to the hotel now and, uh, you know, we've got stories to tell. Well, the Holy Spirit isn't finished yet. Are you ready for what happens next? So we're there we are, like this town in the middle of nowhere. Like the last time anyone, like there's a, like, three of us who are conspicuously not Burmese, like me. <laughs> but the last time white people were in that village was never. Like there's no scenic waterfall, there's no ancient ruins. Like, it's like, why would you go there? Well, you, nobody has ever been there except these poor people who are eking out a living. So uh, one of our team is a good with the, with the soccer ball. He's kicking the soccer ball with the little village kids. And then, every, of course, there's nothing to do there. So everyone in the whole village comes out like, hey, what's up with the white people? And this is sort of like weird. And... And then we all go inside to the little thatched roof uniplex, like so community center, school, clubhouse, everything under one thatched roof. Grandmas, I'll show you a picture after if you want to see, like the grandmas with the babies, like the whole village, everyone's there, like knee to hip, front to back. And to get to the glorious bottom line, the gospel is preached. The whole village 
puts up their hand. I asked the next day, because I'm watching this, I don't know Burmese, I'm like, I'm this, maybe you're like me, you're like that skeptical person, like, what really happened there, Joe? Was it really like that everyone said yes to Jesus? Or because, like, you know, so of course I'm, I'm not disbelieving what I saw, but I, but I want to know, like, what happened? So I took, I transcribed ever so carefully with the translator as he described to me what happened, which is that the whole village just said yes to Jesus. And I said, so how do you know that they said yes to Jesus? And he said, because I asked them, I asked them, like, do you know what you're saying yes to? And they said back to me, yes, this is the good news that we've been yearning to hear. And it turns out this village is a, you know, are the least and the last lost people. Like nobody cares about them. It's a hard scrapple group. They're not even a, like a, tri- not even a tribe. They're just like this, like this basket of lost, lost people. And as the word was preached about that in Christ you can be found and have and be adopted. Like people are like, that's what we want. So, like I'm like, no, Joe, stay, stay with us. Like keep going, keep going. Like, it, but it is possible also to plant a church in a day. And by the Lord's providence, in our little group was a, a pastor, a Burmese pastor, who lived not too far from there. He followed up, and I was promised because you know I want to. I don't want to be these people taken. You know, I actually did not take a picture of the hands because that feels kind of cheesy. <laughs> oh, look at all the hands. Everyone go, oh. Because we want fruit that will last, not hands that are raised in a moment. We want fruit that will last. So I've been assured that a church has actually been planted. There's discipleship. There's all the follow-up. And it's being pastored. I'm like, praise God. Yes. So the whole point of this the where is wherever you go, wherever the Spirit would lead you. You might actually be on your way to somewhere and feel like, wait a second, I might need to go over here. Like, you just get the nut. Like, this is, it's a bit of an, a bit of an acquired thing. You've you got to take a step of risk and faith because sometimes it feels a little bit like subjective or a little bit like, oh, is it just me or did I have the, you know, is it the pizza or like, I feel like I should go here. And then it's amazing what happens because, you know, here's the way it works. Like the, back to our earlier story, that Roman leader who wants to hear, he's seeking God, wants to hear the good news and then gets interrupted by someone else. So the Lord is, is working the plan view, like, okay, hello, sister, like, can you please interrupt your life and go over to there, but I don't need to go to, but I think the Holy Spirit's talking. And then over there, you meet someone who's yearning to know Christ. I'm going to tell a quick story from Terrace, British Columbia. Any been, been to Terrace? Okay, oh, you got, travelers you are. So I had the privilege of being there three weeks ago with an evangelism training team, working from a local church, in a local church. And... Um, of course, we would spend the morning doing a bit of training, a good a bit of time praying in the Spirit, like, Lord, guide us. Fill us and guide us. So one of the, uh, one of the people in our team was looking at a map and was praying and felt a particular stirring. He doesn't even live in Terrace, like myself visiting. He felt a particular stirring to go to this street. Like on this street, like this corner of this street. So it was like, so he and, so his, his name's Phil, and he went with Stuart. And the two of them, they're like, I don't know. Like, the, like this, you know, like we keep, like what's, okay, friends, what's the worst thing that could happen if you get it wrong? Like, okay, it's not that bad. <laughs> but what if you get it right? Because this is discernment, this is trying. You know, like, Lord, is there a door here? So they literally go knock on this door, and a woman answers the door who was actually crying out to God. So she followed up and sent this email to the evangelist who showed up at her door just out of pure obedience. Like he, they literally felt the Spirit leading them to this street, not just this street, but this corner of the street and this door. She says, hi, Phil, I just want to thank God for sending you to reach out and to share the gospel with others. Do, do you need to hear this today? Like, this is someone who is sitting at home, 
You'll hear. I really needed that boost, and to hear it from someone else last week when you and Stuart showed up, that day I felt betrayed, you know, like I was trying my best to believe, and I don't listen to what others had to say about it, but you know, I let other people's opinion get to me. I felt like God was in God, I was losing my friends, my family, and what do I do? We always turn to drugs and alcohol just to make us feel a little happier, but I knew that's not the answer. Maybe you know some people like this. Maybe you were these people like this. I just didn't want to open up because, you know, it would, I would start crying, so I kept it inside. Last week, I felt like my best friend was going against me because of my choices, and I thought she would never do what I... Okay, uh, I thought she would never do that I was kind of angry, and I was like, okay, God, I cannot make this up, right? This is, uh, I know now you're the only one I need, so you know I stay at home most of the time, and I talk with God myself openly in our home. I don't usually tell people this, but I said, God, I need your help. I feel like I'm losing the people who I thought cared the most, but I don't want to say things back to them to you because you know that that would hurt to take revenge so I kept saying God I need new friends God please send me your angels I need you I kept saying that an hour later we're not making this up like an hour later you and Stuart showed up I'm like wow Terrace okay Burma like oh Burma oh you know over there, you should see how God moves. Well, how about Terrace? Isn't this fun? Is anyone like, like following Christ is actually supposed to be an adventure, not like a duty? And I'm like, wow, really? It really happened. There are people out there who care, and God can hear you. After you guys left, I did nothing but cry and thank God for everything. I felt scared. So they invited her to the church, right? I felt scared to go to church, so I prayed every day that God, I would want to go to church on that Sunday, and I kept reading and meditating God's word, asked for strength and confidence to go. So she did go, and she brought her family, and they were well-received. And this is an ongoing story of God's grace. So how about this one? Are you ready? We actually had a sober weekend, And I pray to stay sober for the rest of our lives. I know that it will not be easy, but I keep Jesus on my mind all day. I just wanted to share that with you. Is anyone getting a little stirred up about the mission heart of God? And this is you here. Who, what, when, where, why is our final point? Like, why really... Well, it's a couple of levels. One is obedience. He calls us to go, so really you got to go. Like, we read at the start of the service uh, with humility, the call to obedience. But why? Well, why bother, really? Because this is the heart of God. Once the why is really settled, the people are lost without Christ How could we not but step out into that obedience and see what God will do? And that's way more fun, way more interesting, way more eventful. And then you get to see, like the first missionaries, you get to see today what God yet wants to do in Victoria. Because... I believe there's so much more that God wants to do. I'm not, and who do I? Who am I? I'm just visiting. You folks live here. Your heart is for your city. Your heart is for your area. Even more than you, God's heart is for this city and for this area. So as we close, I am very aware of the fact I, I, planting a church, getting ministry started is an all-consuming task. In fact, it can actually be quite preoccupying, even just to, to keep going. I want to come alongside you folks and lift your heads about this call to the nations, which, yes, is all the people at the ends of the earth, but also the people who God is bringing from the ends of the earth to Victoria. Not just university students, not just refugees, immigrants, new neighbors. People are being moved by God. People are being moved from places that you actually can't go to that are unreached. And they are here, and they are your neighbors. They're within reach. 
Will you ask the Lord to give you an attentive heart that's interruptible? Have some more margin. For what? For mission. And lastly, I also want to lift your head of the fact that I know, like, boy, I am not here to pass the offering plate for the global cause of Christ. You know, like, already, like, here we are. Like, guys just are getting going. And, and um, you know, I don't actually, I don't have an offering plate. <laughs> don't got one. But I'll tell you what the pastor said to me on the way over here this morning. So I was sharing, like, what I'm going to talk about, and, and they said, I, I, the church that I'm a part of, in, this is in Laval, Montreal, it was a church plant a few years ago. Because I had said to them, you know, like, I'm, I'm not here to raise an offering, and like, I don't care if you guys have five cents to give to the global cause of Christ. I'm after your hearts this morning. <laughs> like, get your hearts elevated to think about the, about the nations, the ethne. Well, and the pastor said to me, oh, that's not right. You've got to tell them they've got to give something. Like anything. Like, in fact, if you have still five cents, and we don't have pennies anymore because they're extinct, but because there's, like, they made this point that people gave something to get them started, and, people, and you're giving something to get this started, but there's something about the act of actually giving something that seems to activate faith. So I don't know. I just thought that I, it was interesting being chided by the pastor of another church plant that I should be not so... Nonchalant or cautious about the money part. So I'm just saying what they said. But to activate your hearts. And Joe did ask me, Greg, if you can present to, to us like a partner church planter that would be similar to us, that we could get a heart of. So I want to introduce you to Pastor Chalum. It's part of my mission today. Because, uh, you know, I have been praying since you asked me. And there's a new church plant happening that I, just, I don't know, but. I don't, maybe I could be the matchmaker. And I'll tell you how you're going to benefit if they pray, for, if that group starts praying for you folks, look out. Because I could, over potluck, ask, like ask me to tell you the story of the woman who came to the church and she was going to die. She knew it in three ways. The medical doctor said, you're going to die, there's no hope. So then she went to, the, she's a Buddhist, so she went to the Buddhist monk. And the Buddhist monk, the expensive one, where you pay extra money, the Buddhist monk said, there's nothing I can do, you're going to die. So then, like a good, um, all-inclusive person, she went to the local witch doctor. And the witch doctor said, there's nothing I can do, you're going to die. So just about dead, she did what the last thing she could possibly do, which was come to the pastor of the church. Oh, I met her. She's alive. She's so alive. She's alive in Christ. She's all physically alive, and she'd like to tell everyone that she meets that she's supposed to be dead. So the fellow who prayed for her um, just might be a ride-along for you guys, because maybe something there. So, Lord, thank you for the privilege being with these friends that's part of your family here in the gorgeous, gorgeous area of, uh, of James Bay in our provincial capital. We pray for your spirit to be poured out afresh on this group. Pray for fresh joy, for fresh hope, for fresh faith, and for you to lift their heads about your call to the nations, whether it is literally to go to the ends of the earth or to receive those who have come from the ends of the earth. But let us be awake today to be on your mission for your, for your namesake. Amen.